Welcome to Between the Lines. Today we're going to discuss who Ellen White really was and how she would have interpreted herself if she were here with us today. Someone who has spent a lot of time getting to know her intimately, her life and times, is George Knight, the author of 32 plus books. Dr. Knight, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here, Sonia. I want to ask you how Ellen White would define herself. If, if, if we had her sitting here today, how would she talk about her writings? Well, that's a good question, because I've, I've thought about Ellen White ever since I've been an Adventist Christian, and uh, I've come to two conclusions. She's the best thing that ever happened to the Adventist Church, and she's the worst thing that ever happened to the Adventist Church. <laughs> I was, I was waiting to see the rest of the clip. <laughs> it's easier to watch that than it is to stand up here after lunch. Too much good food. You know, uh, I forgot my notes. Thank you. It says in the book Education somewhere that uh, when you look out at the audience, and you see that sparkle of intelligence in their eyes, then you know you're communicating. Sometimes after lunch, <laughs> you look out and see something besides intelligence. <laughs> the afternoon meetings are always the most difficult for the speaker, too. But it's a good thing I'm not sitting there, I'd be sleeping. I'm a, Peter's one of my favorite characters, and you know, he slept through really great things, the transfiguration. <laughs> I mean, sleeping through the transfiguration, you really got to be into sleep. <laughs> and then he managed to sleep through Gethsemane, which was probably easier. Now, you can't see from here, but uh, this suit has chocolate spots on it for when I was sleeping in the church. My wife gives me candy to keep me awake, but I was chewing, I was sucking on a piece of chocolate candy and it went all over me because I fell asleep and <laughs> I've been disgraced ever since. <laughs> anyway, uh, in spite of the fact it's the afternoon, I'm glad to see so many people are still here and awake and well. Uh, we are going to talk about reading Ellen White. I'm still putting my notes together because, uh, because of the miscommunication and the confusion I didn't bring them with me, but I think I've got it pretty well figured out what I'm going to supposed to do. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm just going to tell some stories first. Um, I remember the first day I was principal of a fairly large school in Houston, Texas, and I became principal in the middle of the year. Uh, the previous principal wasn't doing very well and threatened to quit one time too often, and uh, everybody said amen, and the next day I was principal. <laughs> and uh, the first lady that phoned up, this was the era of the mini skirt. I mean, they were strange back then, now they're, anyway. <laughs> so this lady phones up. First, first phone call I got as an administrator was from a lady saying uh, that, uh, well, she was, uh, she had something to say, and I finally said, what is it that you would like to tell me? Because she said, oh, we're so glad that you are the principal, because now somebody will hold up the standards. So I finally got it out what she was after, and that is her daughter's skirts were too short. Sometimes the gift of tongues is saying nothing. What I wanted to say is, why don't you do something about it? I said, after all, I've got 150 of these young ladies to worry about. You've got one. Why don't you? But, you know. This lady could talk. I mean, that was her gift, was talking. Uh, you could put the phone down for five minutes and come back and say, uh-huh. And you could, you could keep doing this for a half an hour, and she could still be going. 
And so I had a lot of time to think <laughs> as she was talking. And uh, she got uh, describing how they did it at some schools. Well, they had a, they had a rule that uh, it was two inches above the knee. That would be as short as a skirt could get. So I got thinking about that as she was talking. And I thought to myself, well, two inches above the knee, if you're six foot three, that's, that's a pretty long dress. But I had a uh, high school girl in my uh, school that was built somewhat like a bowling ball with arms and legs, <laughs> which means that two inches above her knee was halfway to her waist. <laughs> and when she bent over, that was the whole show. <laughs> and, I, and then I began to imagine myself running around the schoolyard with a ruler in one hand, grabbing these high school girls by the knee with the other. And, you know, I had so much time to think that it became very fascinating. But I really had the quotation to solve all the problems. You know, I had an Ellen White quotation on the length of dresses. And if you have an Ellen White quotation, you can solve almost any problem. <laughs> Ellen White wrote specifically on the length of dresses. She said that dresses should be shortened eight or nine inches. <laughs> Which if we would have followed that counsel, would have put the hemline somewhere above the waistband. <laughs> you see, you just can't take an Ellen White quotation out of context. Every statement has a context written to specific people, a specific church, and a particular specific time and place. And in every statement, there are principles as well as particulars of time and place. And so, when it came right down to it, I decided I need to deal with the length of skirt problem, but not on a specific rule. We decided that clothing should... I got the young girls together and the female faculty. Clothing should be neat and clean, and modest. And what was modest on one person may not be modest on another, but if they were having problems, I would help them. We never had a dress problem. I got the girls together, we understood each other, and uh, if they wanted their parents to come on and get off work, that was fine. I was plenty willing to call them in. Uh, so, every Ellen White quotation. Now, by the way, the, um, the real name for this talk is uh, Violence and the Red Books. Violently using Ellen White. I'll deal more with that in my next talk. You use her violently when you rip quotations out of their literary and historical context and create Ellen White into something she never was. Um, Violence in the Red Books. The subtitle is Scalping Ellen White with Her Own Tomahawk. Uh, in other words, her enemies have been within the church, by and large. By the way, have, we have misused her. I remember as a third, uh, no, no, in the two-teacher school out in West Texas, I had never heard of a two-teacher school, and there I was teaching in one. Uh, we didn't have any classrooms. We had two Sabbath school rooms with a hallway down the middle connected to a church sanctuary and two bathrooms. And it worked out fairly well until the rain came. What are you going to do with these kids when it rains day after day? I couldn't let them loose in the sanctuary. They were sick and tired of the classroom, so I bought 
table games. I can't remember what games I bought, but I do remember one. It was called Checkers. And we had some fairly... We had some people that were very strict on Ellen White in that school. And I had three brothers in my classroom. And the, youngest, the middle brother was named Stephen. And he came up to me one day and he said, uh, Mr. Knight, do you know what my daddy says? That Mrs. White says about checkers. And he had that look on his face like he had me. And I said, Stephen, I'm pretty sure that I know what your daddy says that Mrs. White says about checkers. Don't play them. Yeah. I said, Stephen, have you ever read those statements? He said, no. I said, I'll read them to you, but first I want you to go home and ask your daddy a question. Ask him if it's all right to play Monopoly. Now, you understand the principle of monopoly. Bankrupt thy neighbor. <laughs> take away all of his hotels. Take away all of his houses. Take away all of his property. And when he's bankrupt, I thought they should just put a little circle in the center, cut it out, and put suicide there, and that's the way you could end the game. <laughs> or if you want to play it on Sabbath, just call it hell. I don't know. But you know, monopoly, by its very nature, bankrupt thy neighbor, really isn't based upon Christian principles. And it's about 50 times worse in terms of time consumption and everything else than checkers. So I've, a couple, few days later, Stephen came, Stephen came back, and I'd forgotten I'd asked the question. He said, uh, Mr. Knight, my daddy says it's okay to play Monopoly because Mrs. White didn't say anything about Monopoly. <laughs> well, Monopoly probably hadn't been invented. So I asked, I said, Stephen, let's read those quotations. I said, Stephen, after I read a quotation, if you had a choice between exercising physically and playing checkers, which would you do? Of course, I knew the answer. This was one wired kid. I mean, he was all physical. He said, Mr. Knight, you know I'd be out there playing games. I said, okay, Stephen. Would you gamble with these things? Uh, Mr. Knight, you know I wouldn't do that. I thought to myself, well, probably not in front of me. But anyway, I said, Stephen, you have some serious problems. But one of them is not checkers. Later on, I had a student, later became a vice president at Andrews, did a doctoral paper for me of all things, on checkers. And he discovered why the statements were written in the first place. James White had several strokes fairly early in his life. And Ellen White took him at one time to Dansville, New York, a health care institute called Dans at uh, health our home on the hillside. And uh, I think it was Dr. Caleb Jackson said, Brother White, your problem is that you are too serious. You think about religion too much. What you need to do is get your mind off of these things. You need to dance and play checkers. Uh, James kind of liked the therapy. You can imagine James out there dancing and... But Ellen White had a different view. She thought that religion was not bad, that religion 
If you had a faith in God, it would be good for you. It would help in your healing. And she furthermore believed that you should get your mind active and you should get your body active. So against the wishes of the Battle Creek Church, she took James up to northern Michigan to a place called Greenville where they had a piece of property. And she got him by trickery active. People would come in and they want to answer, ask James and Ellen religious questions. Ellen would leave the room and James would be stuck with the, giving the answers. She wanted to get him mentally active. Somehow they had a crop in the ground and James says one day, it's time for the harvest. I'm going to have to get out and get the neighbors to help us. James left the front door. Ellen White put her tennis shoes on, went out the back door, went to every neighbor first and said, when James comes, say no. James came back all discouraged. He says, I can't believe it. We've done so much for these people over the years and not one of them will help us. Ellen says, well, James, I guess we'll have to do it ourselves. So James drove the buggy or the, the wagon. Ellen White stood up on top and stacked the hay and Willie tossed it onto the wagon. These were the beginnings of James's healing. Meanwhile, Dr. Horatio S. Lay, the only Adventist physician at the time, started what became known as the Western Health Reform Institute, later became known as the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Horatio S. Lay had been a physician in Dansville, New York, at our home on the hillside, and when he started the Adventist Sanitarium, he was smart enough to leave the dancing behind. But he brought checkers as therapy. And that's where the statement comes from in the first volume of the testimonies. Ellen White believed that checkers might be good for some things, I guess, but not for therapy. And then we get another statement that came out in the review. Back in those days, the review was, you just, they'd, they'd publish anything, you know. I mean, you find out all kinds of stuff. Somebody writes in, who is Ellen White to say we shouldn't play checkers when everybody knows she carries a, a set around in her suitcase? Well, that wasn't really true. But these kinds of things got checkers into the Adventist vocabulary. You see... Behind every statement, there is a definite context. Reminds me of two Adventist physicians, Dr. and Mrs. Kress, missionaries to Australia. No, I don't want to start there. I'm going to go back. Ellen White once made a statement, to put it bluntly, don't eat eggs. That's straight enough, isn't it? Don't eat eggs. She wrote this to a family whose children were having a particular problem, and she says eggs are helping cause that problem. So don't eat eggs. That, that's pretty clear. Then there was Dr. and Mrs. Dr. Kress. They were dying of health reform. They had discovered so many things that was wrong to eat that they were not getting proper nourishment. So Ellen White wrote them a letter and said, if you want to live. Now, most health reformers do want to live. <laughs> if you want to live, take two raw eggs every day, crack them into grape juice and drink them. Eggs have medicinal properties. Probably missing some vitamin B12 or something, I don't know. Anyway, Dr. and Mrs. Kress started taking in their 30s Two raw eggs every day mixed in grape juice 
And in his 80s, 50 years later, he was still practicing medicine and going strong and still eating raw eggs. Now the question is, if you've got no eggs and raw eggs, and you've got the counsel from the same person, which is the inspired counsel? Depends on what your problem is. It depends on what your problem is. Now our problem is this. We have some Adventists that go around and they, they take the strongest statements and try to act like everybody's got the same problem. Okay? They try to force these quotations on everybody. But interestingly enough, I've met some real health fanatics. I used to be one. I've never seen a health fanatic take the yellow and white quotation that says you should eat raw eggs. They always take the no egg one, and I can never figure that out. <laughs> At any rate, every statement as a person, an institution, a situation behind it. It also consists of two types of information, principles and particulars of time and place. Let me illustrate what I mean by principles. Ellen White says in the book Education that every young lady should learn to harness a horse and drive a horse. Now tell me, Dr. Babcock, are you following Ellen White? <laughs> I mean, I never noticed any horse manure in the yard out here. I think that we need to send, you know, have an investigation here on whether Dr. Babcock is really, you know, following what he should be doing. Well, that's a particular in time and place that young ladies should be self-sufficient in transportation. If we take the principle today, they should have driver's education and know how to change a tire. The principle is... Being sufficient in transportation. Being able to get from one place to another. The particular of time and place changes across time. Just as it did with the length of skirts. Okay? The principle is always the same. Modesty, good health. Because remember, when Ellen White said short skirts should be shortened 8 inches to 9 inches, you think air pollution is bad? Do you know what we had before we had automobiles? Horses. And nobody ever cleaned it up. And there were tons of the stuff on the ground in two forms, liquid and solid. <laughs> and in the summertime, it made wonderful dust. And since people didn't have air conditioners, it blew through their windows, flavored their food. I, I mean, it went everywhere. But these long dresses sweeping up this, oh, and males. The national sport was spitting. The spittoon didn't get developed until sometime uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and, and spitting took place in the house as well as in the yard. Except polite men did not spit on the table. And tuberculosis was the big killer. And you got all this horse manure down there that's really nice and wet and soggy in the winter and dry in the summer, and you get all this stuff coming out of people's mouth down there and other stuff, and you got these skirts dragging on the ground, <laughs> sweeping all this stuff up. Long skirts weren't healthy. Besides that, they were, they were, they were, they were heavy. And, and for health reasons, Ellen White counseled shorter Skirts. The principles are the same. We still should drink, dr 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 dress healthily. That brings me, I want to use a few illustrations here. I'll use illustrations from two fields. Number one, diet. And number two, education. You know, one of the greatest contributions of Ellen White 
was her work on education. It's unfortunate that so many Adventists today don't realize the responsibility they have to have their children in Christian schools. She was very avid. I've been a fan of Christian education ever since I discovered what it is. Anyway, at first, the first school we had, we really didn't know what to do to get principles of Christian education. 1874, what became Battle Creek College, uh, Ellen White had suggested that people should learn practical things. They should have courses in Bible so they understand the, the flow of biblical history. Uh, they should have, uh, for that, a chance to get something practical they could do. At that time, of course, agri agriculture was quite practical. Something that they could do in their lives, not just head knowledge. Well, when they founded the college, they did everything just the opposite. They didn't have any Bible classes. They put it on a postage stamp piece of property and they sold half of it because they had too much space. Nothing practical. Basically, you could go for seven years and study the Greek and Latin classics. Not even biblical Greek. The school basically was a failure. 1890s. Ellen White founds another school. This one she's very active in. It's called Avondale School for Christian Workers in Australia. They had it so they could teach practical topics. Bible was the orienting part of the curriculum. They had good health principles. Students got mental, physical balance so that they were not lopsided in their development. Ellen White said of that school that it is an object lesson. It is a sample school. She called it a model school. She called it a pattern. And in 1900, she flatly stated that the school in Avondale is to be a pattern for other schools which will be established among our people. And the reformers, and by the way, Avondale was way out in the country. I mean, it's way out. It had 1,500 acres of land. It was way out in a rural area. And the reformers in America said, we want to be like Avondale. And they took the property in the little village of Healdsburg and they sold it out because we want to be out in the country. And they put it on top of Howell Mountain where Pacific Union College is today. I graduated from there. We used to say it was 10 miles from the nearest known sin. <laughs> I mean, it was up there. Battle Creek College moved out of Battle Creek into the wilds of the orchards of Berrien Springs. And Adventist schools around the world became rural institutions. In fact, we have priceless properties around the world because we bought it when it was rural and now the cities have grown up around them and uh, city property we could not afford to get in many, many places. So the Avondale model, you got people talking about the blueprint. And, uh, and I'm going to read you something. Now here's, here's, what I, here's a statement from Ellen White that I call straight testimony. You know what straight testimony is? It's something so straight that you can use it like a spear to run it right through your neighbor. Okay? And the reason I know this is straight testimony because it starts with my favorite word, never. Okay? Never. Now you understand the meaning of never. Now well, maybe you don't. It means no exceptions. It means... Eh, it's something you can't do. Never! I got the real stuff here. Never! I mean, I'm really hung up on that word because I used to be able to use Ellen White like a weapon when I was perfect, okay? Never! Never can the proper education be given to the youth in this country or any other country unless they're separated a wide distance from the cities. And she gives the reason. 
the customs and practices in the cities unfit the minds of the youth for the entrance of truth. Now we've got we to gotta take a look at this. Never. Now never means it's universal in, times, in terms of time. I mean not like tomorrow or the next day. In this country or any other country, that means everywhere. I mean this is really a good statement. Unless they're separated a wide distance from the cities. Why? Because the cast, customs and practices in the cities unfit the mind of the youth for the entrance of truth. Now let me give a personal illustration here. I became principal of an inner city Adventist school in Houston, Texas. You could not get to my school without passing totally nude joints fully illustrated on the outside. On Monday morning, I had to walk around because we sold part of our property to an apartment complex. I had to pick up needles, not vaccinating needles, okay, and prophylactics off my play yard. I mean, I understand what she's saying, okay? Never in this country or any other country. That comes from six volume of the testimonies, and I, I don't have the page. That's one of them I didn't have with me, but it's in there. I found this one. Joel helped me put this stuff together. I went down to the university yesterday and tried to thought, what did I talk about in that talk? Uh, but I didn't come up with all the references. Here's another one, 9T. He brought this one this morning, 9 testimony. Now, that was written, um, this is written after the Avondale experience. I want that straight. Remember, that one's never in this country or any other country. But as we moved into the, tw uh, the 20th century, we began to get more and more people that, that couldn't move out of the cities. They, 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 were, they, they didn't have the finances. They had reason to be in the city. Now, watch this. So far as possible... These schools should be established outside the cities. Well, she still has the same ideal, but the reality, she's going to come down now. In Ellen White, there's always the ideal and the real. The ideal and the real. We're going to come back to this on several levels. So far as possible, these schools should be established outside the cities, but in the cities, there are many children who could not attend schools away from the cities, and for the benefit of these schools, for the benefit of these, schools should be opened in the cities as well as in the country. Ellen White was very flexible. She never changed on the ideal, okay? Never changed on the ideal. But she always took realities into consideration. Now the problem is this. We find people who only have one quotation. You know, like a single bullet in their gun. Okay? And they're going to push that one quotation upon everybody. And it's never the moderating one that says, well, insofar as possible. It's always the one that says, never. But getting shot with an Ellen White gun. Okay? Now we're going to take a look at this woman. We have created somebody who never lived. Ellen White has been slain in the house of her friends. I, I treat all of this stuff in my book, uh, Myths in Adventism. Basically, the first chapter, Myths of the Inflexible Prophet. It's her so-called followers, so-called, who are inflexible. Ellen White gave counsel on two levels, the ideal and the real, and she was willing to moderate her own counsel. In fact, my book, Reading Ellen White, is aimed at letting us understand how Ellen White understood how she interpreted her own writings. How did Ellen White interpret her own writings? Well, here's a good case right here. I'm going to, we, we have a school in California back in the early 1900s. And the school board got into an argument. Now, I suppose your school board doesn't get into arguments, but this one did. Okay? <laughs> 
and it got into an argument over an Ellen White quotation. I mean, that's a serious, right? You got an Ellen White quotation, you know exactly what to do. Checking your brains, that's it. You got a quotation. Now here's the quotation. Parents should be the only teachers of their children until they've reached eight or 10 years of age. That's third testimonies 137. Parents should be the only. Now you understand the word only. You understand what the word only means, right? No exceptions. Straight testimony. Parents should be the only. That's the, that's the word you've got to emphasize. It's, it's almost as good as never. The only teachers of their children until they are eight or ten years of age. Now, the school board got into such a big struggle over this. that they couldn't move forward and they couldn't move backward. The interesting thing about the school, it was on Ellen White's property. <laughs> and she lived there. And so they invite her in for an interview. And, 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 and see, the, the problem was, because she would made this statement, they wouldn't have any first, second, third grade. So the kids, because both, of them, both parents were working in St. Lena Sanitarium, the kids were running loose all day. Here's Ellen White. Now listen to this because this is a real woman dealing with real people. In fact, it's, it, it, this is like a board meeting, man. It, it gets you upset just reading it. In fact, there's even a pastor there that doesn't want to get involved in Christian education because it costs money. And Ellen White says, money, money, forget it. We got kids. <laughs> okay, here's Ellen White. This, this is, she's being interviewed. This is, this, is, this, this is the best illustration we have of Ellen White interpreting her own writings. Those who assume the responsibility of parenthood should first consider whether they will be able to surround their children with proper influences. The home is both a family church and a family school. There's a basic principle. I'm going to tell you right now. The major religious education among your community is not the church, it's the home. The major educational institution is not the school, it's the home. And I can tell you, and I, George could probably agree with me here, Dr. Babcock, when I had a first grader come into my school, it was already too late. The parents had conditioned them on their approach to learning, on their approach to the use of time, on their approach to authority? No, the home is the primary educational and religious institution. Now what we want to do is get strong homes with strong churches and strong schools all working together on the same principle. That is the absolute ideal. But here's Ellen White, right on. The home is both the family church and the family school. She saw the family as absolute central to the health of the religious community and the educational work. Now watch, now remember, remember that statement? Parents should be the only teachers of their children to their eight or 10. Now watch your, now that's an, it's what we call an unconditional statement. An unconditional statement has no ifs, ands, or buts. She didn't say the parents should be the only teachers if, no. She said they should be the only teachers. Now, she's faced with a real life situation. She stated the ideal. Now she's got the reality of real people who are somewhat less than perfect. Mothers should be able to instruct their wise ones, their, excuse me, mothers should be able to instruct their little ones wisely during the er, early years of childhood. If every mother were capable of doing this, and would take the time to teach your children the lessons they should learn in early life, then all children could be kept in the homeschool until they're eight or nine or 10. She's taking her own unconditional statement and making it conditional. Mothers should be able to, well, you could put parents here if you like, okay? Parents should be able to. Well, obviously some aren't able, okay? If every mother were capable, inferring that some aren't, and would take the time, that is, was willing, 
then you can keep children at home, but only if the parents are capable and willing, then the ideal will work. Isn't she's explaining? And then she gets to the most important word in the English language, but. But many who enter the marriage relation fail of realizing all the sacred responsibilities that parenthood brings. Many are sadly lacking in disciplinary power. Such children drift hither and thither. There is nobody in the home capable of guiding them aright. Children who are surrounded by these unfortunate conditions are indeed to be pitied. If not afforded an opportunity for proper training outside the home, they are debarred from many privileges that by right every child should enjoy. Those who are unable to train their children aright should never have assumed the responsibility of parents. Well, that's easier to say than it is to get rid of the problem. <laughs> I mean, you can't tell them to go back where they came from, okay? I mean, <laughs> so you're stuck with a problem. But because of their mistake and misjudgment, shall we, not, shall we make no effort to help their little ones to form right characters? God desires to deal with us to deal with these problems sensibly. I like that. Ellen White says we should use our sense. I know some Adventists that if they have a quotation, they can operate on nonsense. Okay? Ellen White, you, know, you got a quotation, do you need to think? According to Ellen White, yes. You've got to think about what you're trying to achieve and the principles it takes to get there. You've got to realize the difference between the ideal and the real. You not only have to have a quotation, you've got to have a brain. You've got to think, you, know, you don't have to check in your brain, brother, just because you become an Adventist. Isn't that good? That's good. It's going to get better. Here's a work that must be done for the families and for children that are as old as seven, eight, nine years. We should have a lower department that is a second department where these children can be instructed. The time she gets finished, she's down to kindergartens, advocating kindergartens. When I heard what the objections were that the children could not go to school till they were 10 years old, I wanted to tell you that there was not a Sabbath-keeping school when the light was given to me that the children should not attend school until they were old enough to be instructed. Here she's putting it in historical context. When I said that, we didn't have any Adventist schools. Now we do. She says that makes a difference. She's going to go on with that. Oh, this is my favorite right here. This is how it is. And my mind has been greatly restored in regard to the idea, and then she quotes her so-called followers. Why, Sister White has said so-and-so, and Sister White has said so-and-so, and therefore we're going right up to it, end quote. She's... Now she comments on those kinds of people. God wants us all to have common sense, and he wants us to reason from common sense. Circumstances alter conditions. Circumstances change the relation of things. Ellen White is basically saying, even if you've got a quotation, you still have to use basic good common sense on how to apply it. Okay? Well, let's see what we got here. I think her son Willie's going to talk for a while. He says, I find, Mother, that our people throughout the states and throughout the world, I must say, sometimes make very far-reaching rulings based on an isolated statement. And Willie goes on, there is a principle underlying every precept. And we cannot understand properly the precept without first grasping the principle. The ideal plan is that the mother should be the teacher. This is still Willie White, his, her, her, son, her son. I have felt that it was a great misfortune to our cause from Maine to California, from Manitoba to Florida, that our people should take that statement that the child should have no teacher but the parent until it is eight or 10 years old as a definite forbidding of these, those children to have school privileges. If I understand it, that is really the question brought before us this morning. And we'll close with Ellen White. Well, if parents have not got it in them, you might as well stop where you are. 
Therefore, we have got to make provision because there are a good many parents that have not taken it upon themselves to discipline themselves, let alone their children. Oh, by the way, I, I know this is frightening for me to say in public, I didn't need to need the parents. After I had the kids in school for a few weeks, I had a pretty good profile of the parents. <laughs> God has to smile, I think, when he looks at us. You know, my dad used to say, this hurts me more than it hurts you, when it was really causing some pretty severe wounds on my body. And I used to be cursing him under my breath because I didn't dare open my mouth very far. And I didn't really understand the passage until I had my own children and realized that my own son had all of his grandfather's bad habits, although we lived 2,000 miles away and he'd only seen him for about four times in his life. Now, how all those bad habits ever got from my father to my son without going through me has been a miracle. <laughs> and suddenly I realized what my father meant. I had to punish my son for acting like me. I didn't understand what Moses said. Children shall pay for the sins of the parents until the third and fourth generation until I taught school. <laughs> God is good. Now, here we go on. Yeah, no, I, I'm not sure what time I started, so I'm not sure what time I'm supposed to start, but stop. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going on here. I've got a few more illustrations. Uh, Illinois... You know, we have some people, she was, she was flexible, not only in education, she believed in health reform, but that she did not believe that one health reform model would fit everybody. But you get people taking the strongest quotations. Uh, she says here, uh, one rule of diet cannot be made for everyone because people differ. Huh. We're dealing with somebody that's got more flexibility than some of her Followers. She remarked, that's in Councils of Diets and Foods 294. Again, in the use of foods, we should exercise good, sound, common sense. Oh, you've got to use your brain there too. And should take occupational and geographical factors into consideration. Her plea for us was to behave like, and I quote, intelligent human beings on the diet question. Well, we could do a lot with some of that stuff. But I'm going to read my favorite stuff right now. No, we can't get to that yet. I just want to say right now, and I really have a, a plea here. The church at one time put Ellen White at the wrong place. Many Adventists placed her where the Bible should be. That was wrong. But when we moved in the other direction, we moved to the place where we've almost totally neglected her. We have a wonderful gift. And God can bless this church through those writings. A central problem all of us face in our lives is that of balance. One polar extreme is to rely unthinkingly on prophetic authority. I have a quotation or I have a text. While the other is to lean on rationality in an unhealthy manner that allows it to become a rationality or an excuse for what we wanted to do anyway. On the one hand, we must always understand and apply the truth of Scripture through the aid of our rationality. To rely either on Scripture or rational understanding without the other is a fatal misconception. Authoritative revelation and sanctified reason go hand in hand as we seek to understand God and develop a Christian educational system and a Christian lifestyle. God gave us the power of creative thought and he expects us to use it for his glory. Christians, Christian living is a dynamic experience, inseparably linked to thinking and acting upon one's thoughts. 
Christianity is therefore a moral enterprise in which men and women have responsibility in the eyes of God. Rigidity and inflexibility of thought and action are the antithesis, the opposite of Christianity. The Christian's task is to search out God's revelations and then to seek them, to put them into practice in current living without doing violence to the intent of their underlying principles. That takes personal dedication as well as the sensitivity to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It was in connection with the Holy Spirit that Ellen White lived and sought to guide the Adventist church. Christ, who in his flexible manner was able to meet all classes of people, exemplified this same stance. His adaptable yet principle-based life and teachings burst the old wineskins of Pharisaism. You heard it said, but I say unto you, as he drove beyond their tradition to the principles of Christian living. Now, I'm going to read something here. This is something that ought to be read weekly by most Adventists. It's called Proper Use of the Testimonies. Proper use of the testimony is on health reform, but it applies to every other topic. It's found in Third Selected Messages, 283 to 287. I'm just going to quote some here. Listen. Questions are coming in from brothers and sisters making inquiries in regard to health reform. Statements are made that some are taking the light in the testimonies upon health reform and making it a test. Can you imagine that? They select statements made in regard to some articles of diet that are presented as objectionable. Statements written in warning and instruction to certain individuals who were entering or had entered on an evil path. They dwell on these things and make them as strong as possible, weaving their own peculiar objectionable traits of character in with these statements and carry them with great force, thus making them a test and driving them where they will only do harm. This is Ellen White talking about her own true followers, trues in quotation marks. These are her false followers, but often the most zealous ones with her writings. We see those who will select from the testimonies the strongest expressions and without bringing in or making any account of the circumstances under which the cautions and warnings are given, make them a force in every case. Thus they produce unhealthy impressions upon the minds of the people. There are always those who are ready to grasp anything of a character which they can use to rein up people to a close, severe test and will work elements of their own characters into the reforms. They will go at the work making a raid upon the people, picking out some things in the testimonies. They drive them upon everyone and disgust rather than win souls. They make divisions when they might and should make peace. Again, you'll never find this next statement in any homemade compilation. Let the testimonies speak for themselves. Let not individuals gather up the very strongest statements given for individuals and families and drive these things because they want to use the whip and to have something to drive. That's Ellen White. I could do so much more. Ellen White interpreting her own writings. Here's another one. I, I, she was one frustrated person. I don't know if you... Well, I, I, I've got to use an illustration first. I, I didn't bring this quotation from her husband, James, written in 1867, March 17, Review and Herald, in which she's trying to get people to act sensibly on health reform. He says some people move too fast and some people move too slow. I'm going to give an illustration from an elementary classroom. Sometimes, you know, I would have a group of elementary students and I'd have some sensitive children sitting on the front row and all you had to do was just speak to them crossly and they would go into tears. 
And then I'd have that seventh grade boy or two in the back row, you could hit him on the head with a baseball bat and you wouldn't even know they were there. <laughs> they wouldn't know you were there. And so what do you do? You go in, I mean, because sometimes the whole class is misacting. You go in the next day and you're going to give it to them because you're not going to have that kind of a classroom again. So you go in and, and you really lay it on the line. Wow, you, you, you give it to them with both barrels. What happens? The poor little girl in the front row, you crushed her. And the hardened characters in the back row, they didn't even hear you. God's hardest job is to communicate with human beings. As James White says, some of us are so active that as soon as we find the prophet said it, we run out and we go too far and cause difficulties. And then Ellen White has to come back when she was still alive and say, you went too far. But what happens? The people that went too far created their own fanatical problem. The other people only read the, oh, we went too far. So the people that haven't done anything do less. How does God speak to a church? Only with great difficulty. One last quotation. Talk about the ultimate frustration of a prophet. What I might say in private conversations would be so repeated as to make it mean exactly opposite to what it would have meant had the hearers been sanctified in mind and spirit. I am afraid to speak even to my friends, for afterwards I hear Sister White said this and Sister White said that. My words are so rested and misinterpreted that I'm coming to the conclusion that the Lord desires me to keep out of large assemblies and refuse private interviews. What I say is reported in such a perverted light that it is new and strange to me. It is mixed with words spoken by men to sustain their own theories. Now I'm going to close with what I believe we need to teach every new convert and every old convert in the Adventist church. Where do you start reading? If you listen to Ellen White, you will not start with her. There's only two real tests of a prophet. Number one, they point to Jesus. Number two, they point to the Bible. Ellen White has driven me to scripture. So the first thing I need to tell a convert and an old convert is to read the Bible. So, what are you going to do? They start out with Genesis. Oh, they love Genesis. It's just full of stories. And they like the first part of Exodus. And then they get the 15 chapters on how to build a sanctuary. <laughs> and if they make it through 15 chapters on how to build a sanctuary, they get the whole book on how to kill a goat. <laughs> and if they're smart at all, by that time they've quit reading. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'm not going to tell people to start with Genesis. I'm going to tell them to start in the most important place. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Get to know Jesus. Okay? You want to know how to read the Bible? You start with Jesus. And then read the Acts of the Apostles, the story of the New Testament church. And when you've done that, I'm going to give you a little outline. It says read Genesis, read the first 20 chapters of Exodus, read this chapter, you know, read this. You know. I want to let you read all the stories of the Bible. I want you to get the story. And then maybe you're ready for a letter from Paul. But I'm going to tell you that every time Paul wrote a letter, there was somebody back there that had some quirks. Okay, I mean, these are testimonies that Paul was writing, okay? He's writing to people who've got problems. He's writing to churches who's got problems. This is it's the same thing with Ellen White. You, when there's a letter, when there's a council, you've got to understand what he's trying to address. So I'm going to tell you how to read a letter. Then read Paul. And then maybe by that time you're ready for poetry. You go to the Psalms and, and, the, and maybe the Proverbs. Maybe that time we'll go to Apocalyptic. And after we've done it all, I'm going to put you on Leviticus. <laughs> because now Leviticus has meaning. 
because you know the story. Not only of the earthly lamb, but you know about the heavenly lamb, and you know what the goats are all about, and the shedding of blood. Now, I, you can't really test the prophet until you know scripture. Okay? I mean, we tell to, we ask people when they join the church, well, do you believe you know, the gift of prophecy? Do you believe the Ellen White? Well, you can't really say that in three-week baptism, you know, evangel. You know, you, it takes years to get to know Scripture really thoroughly. But when somebody's going to read Ellen White, you know where I'm going to start them out? Councils on diets and foods. That's a really great place to start. <laughs> well, that's equivalent to starting in Leviticus. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you, right, I'll get to that in a minute. No, 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 I'm going to start them at the center. I'm going to start them with desire of ages. Get to know Ellen White in her greatest work. Desire of ages, steps to Christ, thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, Christ object lessons, get to know Jesus and what she said about Jesus. Then the Conflict of the Ages series, all the way from patriarchs to prophets, to the great controversy. And by the way, they're framed in... Three words, several thousand pages in the middle, first three words in the first volume uh, of that sit, and the last three words are the same, God is love. Everything else answers the question, is he really love? <laughs> okay, start out with Jesus, conflict of the ages, the history of the church. Okay, now you understand basically her perspective and how she relates to scripture. Now you're ready for a book on, okay, call it health. But I'm still not going to give you counsels and diets and foods. I'm going to give you something more contextual, ministry of healing, which is really written more in context. A counsel book is never made to be read. I'm going to tell you right now, counsels and diets and foods, you could not have all those problems and still be alive. <laughs> it was written to several hundred people who had different problems, over a period of 70 years, and you probably have about 5% of them. You know which 5% you have? The ones you don't want to read. <laughs> Those are the ones you skip over. <laughs> now, get to know Jesus in Ellen White too. Get to know the history of the church. Acts of the Apostles, Great Controversy. Get to know the, the broad picture. And when you're ready for a council of books, don't start with a, a, these little things that have been all taken out of context. Go to the book Education rather than one of the council books on education. Go to Ministry of Healing. And when you are finally got it understood what a compilation is, that it's little short quotations taken out of their historical and their literary context, and there's no way to do that fairly. Did you hear what I said? There's no way to do that totally fairly. Then you're ready. If you've got both eyes open to read something on councils and diets and foods, all the, all the while saying, I wonder what the larger context says. You may have to ask the White Estate for more information on it. Especially if it doesn't sound right. Okay? Behind every statement is a person with a problem or an institution. You cannot fully understand any statement in Scripture or in Ellen White without understanding to some extent both the literary and the historical context. I spent two of my books, Myths in Adventism and Reading Ellen White, just on that those principles. It's an introduction. Another one I've written on Ellen White is called Ellen White's World. You know why she wrote some of the same stuff, some of that stuff? Well, because people weren't very smart back in those days. You know, in the 1830s, the average American never had a bath their entire life. <laughs> Think about it. 
not their entire life. And then comes the health reformer. When I was a kid, we used to joke about the Saturday night bath. Well, if you don't have running water and you don't have a water heater, having a bath is a pretty serious business. You gotta haul all that water in, you gotta heat it on top of the stove, and you got 12 kids. And so the father gets in the water first, <laughs> and then the oldest kid, and by the time kid number 12 gets in, you can't even see halfway down. And that's what, no, this is, this is an historical fact. That's where they got the saying, don't throw out the baby with the bath water. So the reformers were saying one time a week, and here's Ellen White saying, bathe twice a week. <laughs> a place like Hinsdale Hospital, people in the 1840s and the 1850s never went to a hospital to get well. You went to a hospital to die. <laughs> because they didn't understand. Rich people never went to hospitals. They could afford the doctor to come to them. Because they did not understand the germ theory. Okay? In fact, some doctors thought the more blood they had on their garments and on their knife, the more experienced they look. <laughs> and so you went to a hospital to die. So I got books, I got pictures of New York hospitals with rats running across the beds. What kind of a world did Ellen White, don't take drugs, don't take drugs. What does she mean? Well, I'm going to tell you what she meant. They believed that, uh, at least one of the main theories, was that disease was caused by getting your fluids in your body out of balance. And so there's two ways to get rid of fluids. One of them was bleeding. George Washington was bled before he died. They took out one pint, he didn't get better, so they took out a second pint. And after that, he just asked to be left alone. <laughs> now, not only did they bleed you, but they also gave you drugs with arsenic and mercury. And that helped you vacate your liquids out of both ends simultaneously. They called it heroic medicine. And when Ellen White was talking, about not taking drugs, she was not talking about some, what we generally deal with today. She was talking about, she was talking about poison to vacate your body. But yet, some of our missionaries made deadly mistakes. When I went to Seleucia College in Africa, the first thing I did when I got there to teach for a month was go out to the graveyard. There's a whole row of missionaries that would not take quinine. So they all, because of Ellen White, so they all died being faithful to Ellen White. What they thought was Ellen White. The only one who lived to carry on the school to, uh, to quinine. Later, a missionary, I believe, to the Philippines who lost his only son because he wouldn't give him quinine. Maybe it was the South Pacific. He writes to Ellen White and says, should I have given, given what you've said, should I have given my son quinine? She says, I think so. <laughs> Watch out using quotations in an uninformed way can be dangerous to your health, both physically and spiritually. But read in their proper context, they can be a great blessing to both the church and yourselves. My final topic, I think we have a song in between, my final topic will be somewhat autobiographical. It'll be entitled, uh, Why? No, no, I used to be perfect. And I was 